What are some of the traits that characterize digital computation? Well, half of them refer to the empirical views of computation with empirical data, uh, and that's especially machine learning. And then the other half is the theoretical use of computation and computer simulation. In previous lectures of the specialization, we have talked uh, redundantly about both of them already. So I will have links and I will have further links to specific parts of it. So here, machine learning, I'm not gonna extend myself very deeply. You have probably seen that if you've not seen that, please go and check out this content. The idea is with machine learning that we take the traditional workflow of computation on its head. So traditionally we have data and some kind of recipe that computes an output. And now we have some kind of data, we observe reality, there's a world with a lot of problems. And then we define the goal, we want a better world. And then we ask the magical machine learning well, how do you go best about that? And explores, it tells us the, the recipe of how to combine observations with where we want to go. That's why Pedro Dominguez calls it the master algorithm, the algorithm that computes algorithm recipes of going about that. Now, we also talked in a previous lecture about how this has been a long time coming, well, a long time, 70 years, not a long time coming, but they were at the beginning, we thought like, oh, that's pretty easy. We're going to ded dedicate two months in summers to solving these issues. And it took, well, one or two generations of researchers biting their teeth into it. But then what actually got the big, the big advancements was that data won the day. And there was a lot of data and a lot of computational power that wasn't available before. And that led to the, to the feasibility of doing deep neural nets. So deep neural networks, or it's called deep learning. Why is it called deep learning? It's a, a very quick review of that. So for example, deep neural nets solve the problem of vision, of computer vision, also of language and of many other problems that uh, artificial intelligence excels in. It makes a prediction of something else, of, of something following in language models. But let's look at the, at the question of recognizing images, which is something qualitative. For a long time, you have to remember, for a long time, people thought like, no, a machine could not do something qualitative. Even when artificial intelligence was playing chess, people were saying like, yes, but that's just like something mathematical. Images is something qualitative. So how, what does it do? Well, it does something similar to what neurons does. It does it in different layers. So here I have an image of somebody who was my former boss at the United Nations, one of my personal idols. And I want the network to learn who that is because that person is important to me as a personal inspiration has been important through many years. So. Here I have the neural network recognize pixels, basically. And then I, through the input layer, I transform them on different layers and I have them recognize lines and circles. So we go very slowly. We start, actually we start with recognizing contrast. There is black and there is not black. And then I can end up with lines and circles, for example. Now I feed that into additional layers, differently, and that's why it's called deep, learning because it learns by processing over different layers. And then I have another layer that then recognizes some face features that recurrently come, come about. So eyes, at least in my face there too. And you look at many images, you realize, oh, there's something, something recurrent. So there's some kind of, like, I can make a routine of that, a routine, a, a recipe, an algorithm I can make of that. And then it starts to recognize faces and noses and ears and, and necks and, and so forth. And then says, well, let's go a little bit further. And then I can recognize entire, not only face features, entire faces. And I said, well, that's a face. If it has, if it looks like this in this proportion, then I see different phases, faces. <laughs> so I feed it with many, many images of, of face profiles that I get from social media, for example. And it's like, the neural nets also said, oh, that comes up again. And that's how it combines uh, local patterns with features, with phases. And at the end, it realizes, oh, whenever that phase comes about, that is Kofi Annan. And so that's how the deep learning, it's deep because it goes deep into the neural nets, it works. Now, 
I'm certainly not an expert in it, but let's let's ask uh, the world leading expert on it. They call him the godfather of deep learning. And he was not the only one. There were many people working in the field, but certainly he was one of the very early ones who did not give up and continued to push this paradigm. And he trained an entire generation, if not two generations of scientists that made amazing breakthroughs. Science is a social enterprise, so let's listen to Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of deep learning himself, to explain to us what this revolution, the deep learning revolution, is all about. One of the applications of deep neural nets and therefore of modern machine learning, of what people call now uh, generally artificial intelligence, is that I can personalize content. So now we're going to innovation, was the social, one of the social applications of that that makes it so powerful for business models, political campaigns, or philanthropic, but, you know, nonprofit purposes. You, you can use, uh, obviously, this kind of machine intelligence. One thing that we already talked about, and now I call this, look, it's a small n equal one. So the sample that I pick, I now don't have big n, I don't have the entire universe of everything that's happening. Use machine learning actually combine them. So the sample now is the sample size of one. I don't sample and say like, oh, a sample of men and women and men are like this and women are like this. I say, no, you know what? Professor Hilbert is like that. That's not, that's not a group. It's a sample of one. And I can learn about that. And that actually breaks a big paradigm. Also, let's think about economics again, because, you know, most people work for companies and in the economy, so let's think about that. But you can use the same thing for political campaigns, and, and it's oh, widely being used. But it's called mass customization. So traditionally in the economy, what you hear if you do an NBA or something, you hear about Porter's competitive strategy. So uh, traditionally, if you want to have a competitive edge over, over your, your competitors, you have two choices. You can either differentiate or you have cost leadership. And that's how it's traditionally taught when you learn business strategy in an MBA. So you can individualize. You can go to the barkeeper or to the barista who does the coffee exactly as you like it or you drink exactly as you like it. And it might be a little bit more expensive, but it's individualized. And there you have a competitive advantage. Or you have cost leadership. That means you just go to a vending machine and you get a coffee out of the vending machine. And that's one size fits all. And that's that. Now, that's much cheaper than if you go to an individual barista. But then if you specialize in that, also you have a competitive advantage, cost leadership. And traditionally, how it's taught is you have to decide. And companies fall either they differentiate or they go into mass. They either customize and differentiate. It's a custom-made product. Or they go into mass production and then they have cost leadership. Now, the interesting thing here with the digital paradigm what it does, what the data combined with the machine learning allows us to do is we can have individualization, customization because of scale. And here I link to our previous lecture where we talked about recommender algorithms, collaborative filtering. The ones who took the previous course already know what I'm talking about. So this is, uh, is more people that I have, the more I can identify how an individual, even so I have never seen that individual, I can make predictions about that individual derived from many other individuals. And the more people I have in my database, the better I can predict even yet unseen cases. So that's individualization because of scale, mass customization. I don't have to be small and customized or big and plain vanilla. I, I can have both thanks to that. So, and that actually leads then to a positive feedback loop. I have many different users, so I can do machine learning on many differences. I, I find the more users I have, I find like funny quirks. So there are people who have this and this together and I find really like hidden patterns in there. Now, the more machine learning differences I have, I can cater to more different users. So I have scale, because of individualization. So basically what we're doing here is we're breaking this, this, this paradigm that has been dominating NBAs for decades and say you either customize or you go into the mass market. No, what these modern companies do with big data and with machine learning is they mass, mass customize. Individualization because of scale and scale because of individualization. Now, we talked about business models a lot. Let's talk about the public sector. Now, you have these deep neural nets, and they are famously 
a black box is. Nobody really understands what's going on. We just give them an input and for example, reinforcement learning, we give them an objective, a reward for achieving something and then it, it does what it does. And we talked about machine learning. Again, here are some links. Please check them out. The three kinds, supervised, reinforcement and unsupervised learning and all of them work in the same way that you give them data and, and then you don't really know. The algorithm itself computes what the best way is to go about that or several best ways and then you know it's a black box and we saw some cases then how do you regulate that and the crux here is you regulate also you regulate by objective so like same as management by objective in the business sector here you regulate by objective because what you can regulate is the input and please go back and watch these lectures so you have the data as the input and then you have the goal so what you want to do is you regulate the goal and we saw this case where we train an unsupervised machine learning a, a virtuvec space with some first names from curriculas, from CVs. And we realized that male names are in the same space, in this high dimensional, 800 dimensional space, in the same corner as concept like office and female names in the same corner as concept like home. So machine learned that men are executives and females are parents, which per biological definition, there's as many men who are biological parents. So that's a funny thing, but the machine will pick up on that. So what do I do if I do not want the machine to be a sexist? Well, I can actually, well, I cannot change the data. I can change the data too. Actually, I can make synthetic data. Now, if I take data from the real world, humankind, if I just take all the data from the last you know, 250 years and I have them read, I have the AI read all the books and everything that's written on the internet, Humankind is just sexist and racist, and I don't know what is classist. And so the machine will pick up on our biases. Now I can create synthetic data, that's not, that's one way. Or I regulate just by objective and I say, I want an AI that doesn't discriminate. And we talked about these cases. So basically I regulate the output, which is an input to the machine learning. And how that works. And I don't need to regulate the, the, the black box. There has been an article that I liked a lot, an influential article, by Tad, who was an, an advisor of the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice. And he wrote this interesting article, which he calls an FDA for algorithms. And I found that very inspiring because basically what, what he says is, Andrew Tad, what he says is that, look, we don't need to understand these black boxes because a lot of the arguments is like, you know, these companies will never reveal how the algorithm works because that's true. It's their economic value. The algorithm is the, the secret sauce. That's what we are going for. In this age of algorithmification, in the knowledge age, uh, algorithms are the, the way of doing things, the recipe, that's that's what has the value. So for a company to reveal what it's doing, uh, how would you reveal what it's doing? How can you regulate it then? It's a black box. And even if the company would understand, why would it share it? Well, the argument here is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, also doesn't know what's in a medicine or what's in a food. So Coca-Cola company has the recipe, the original recipe of Coca-Cola locked away in some safe, probably somewhere in Arizona, we don't know, and it will not reveal it. And many try to copy it, and there are all of these copies of Coca-Cola over the, over the decades, and they don't have the original recipe. Now, do I need to know the recipe of Coca-Cola to be able to judge the impact of Coca-Cola on people's health? Is there a correlation between consuming that drink and, for example, obesity or heart disease? I don't need to know the secret sauce of the recipe, literally the recipe for Google. I don't need to know the algorithm to see if an algorithm does discriminate between men and women or if an algorithm does mental harm to children. Or if an algorithm, that, you know, so we don't need to do that. So basically the argument here is what we need is an FDA, a Food and Drug Administration, for algorithms. And then you do, we already talked about a previous lecture about algorithmic auditing, studying machine behavior. And then you can test the same as we, like a pharmaceutical company does not need to reveal the recipe of how to do a pharmaceutical uh, medicine in order to judge if it's harmful for people. And the same is very likely to go the way for algorithms. And we probably need to hurry up and catch up in order to make sure that we socially construct algorithms that minimize potential downsides. 
Now, on the flip side, when we have these knowledge black boxes, we can also look into them and make them actually knowledge gray boxes. So I like to call them knowledge gray boxes because in contrary to a human brain that has knowledge, we cannot just open up this human brain and say like, oh, what's going on in that brain with, with that knowledge? But an algorithm that has knowledge, it might be tacit knowledge. And we talked about that before. And But I can study this tacit knowledge and make it explicit. So I can make the black box more gray and, and, and see what's going on. Now, in first instant, that is the other way around how we usually did it. Traditionally, and also like the machine learning paradigm that turned the knowledge process on its head, traditionally, we first had the algorithm of figuring things out and then we used that. So if we take some kind of knowledge, it was first theoretical and then came the empirical conclusion. So for example, if we take one of the biggest scientists, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton wrote down how often there is a full moon. And that's actually what the theory says. That's how often is a full moon. That's what Newton calculated. And you have this algorithm. It's an equation. Newton came up with an algorithm to compute how frequently there is full moon. And that's now we understand like what's, what's going on there. And these numbers, they have meanings. Now, uh, a machine learning algorithm would not go about it like that. What would a machine learning algorithm do? Well, it would just take the digital footprint and look up when people Google full moon. And it turns out they Google it exactly every 29 days. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, is that, wait, is it full moon? Like, when is the full moon? Right? So the machine learning algorithm comes also up like, oh, I don't need Newton. I don't need to know why and how in order to make predictions that the next full moon is in 29 days. I just see a pattern here and I predict that pattern. That led to a big discussion, which is known as the end of theory, as the title here says. So basically the idea is of, of, of Anderson was here, was a very provocative article that they said, well, big data, as long as it's big, doesn't need to know why and how. It will still win in the economy. It will still, so we don't need to understand why an algorithm does something. It will have a competitive advantage. And it's true. Uh, the vast majority of algorithms are the result of A-B testing. You know what that is, right? And so they don't need to know why. There are not many psychologists in, in Silicon Valley or not invited. And Google famously fired every linguist of in the team that was uh, in charge with machine translation. But Google solved the machine translation problem with Google Translate among many more languages that any human can speak just with machine learning. So there wasn't any theory. Actually, these linguists, they, they, they messed up. They made it more, they complicated things. They're like, we don't need any theory. We just need to know which words in English match which words in French. And that's that. So then they trained the machine. Now, once we open up that brain, we can also learn a lot about what's going on. So let's turn this process upside down as machine learning does and go the other way around. For example, there are some things that are tacit knowledge for humans that machine that machines that we don't know how it works because it's tacit knowledge. So if you look somebody in the face, you with a certain probability that's better than chance can predict their sexual orientation. So if you make it binary, we say, is this person homosexual or is this person heterosexual. Let's just make it really easy. Of course, there are many more dozens uh, shades of gray here, but let's have it a binary, a binary task. So the baseline would be 50-50. If you don't know anything, maximal entropy. Uh, but humans turn out, and we knew that for many, many, many years, are a better than, than benchmark. So for women, you know, 54%. And for men, some men want you to know that they are uh, homosexual or, or, or heterosexual in, in some way. So it's a little bit easier because of the signals they send. So it's 61% and we didn't know how, how we're doing that is tacit knowledge. Humans just do it and it's actually funny how we do that. Now you can do the same things for machines. You can train machines and show them different pictures. So for example, are there five pictures of your face on the internet? If there are five pictures of your face in the internet, then it has been shown from this article here from Wang and Kosinski that I can train artificial intelligence that can predict your sexual orientation just from these five pictures with up to 90% accuracy. Now, first of all, let me pause here. That's a, that's, that's a bomb. And for us scientists, the task is to explain that bombs exist. I mean, there, there are, I think, 10 countries on planet Earth that still have the death penalty for homosexuality. 
Now, this is severe because this algorithm, algorithms, machine learning can just do that. It doesn't really matter why, it can do that with a very high accuracy and that can be abused talking about social construction of technology. So first of all, you have to be recognized that the cat is out of the sack and probably we're not gonna put the cat back into the sack. So guess what has to change? Well, that's still an ongoing discussion, but it doesn't change the fact that this is possible now. This kind of knowledge is out there, five pictures of a face and, and AI can do that. Now, what we can also do now is we can open up this black box and convert it into a gray box and see what's going on. So what these researchers did, they had no idea what was going on. So they asked some people with knowledge of, about facial features and the ones who looked at that with, with this knowledge, they said like, yeah, that's clear actually. These, what, what it looked at, for example, you know, this features here and that around the nose and about the eyebrows and so forth. Well, these are features that change that depend on your hormonal balance. So for example, if you do a hormone therapy and your gender is male and you will transition to become female, you take hormones for 13 months, then these little details will also change. So what the algorithm basically detected is these little differences that depend on your hormonal balance that is given to you by, by birth showing us yet another argument that sexual orientation is based, it's a biological feature that's given to you by birth. If, if that wasn't yet known, then the algorithm proved it again. Now, but this taught us something very important about that we didn't know. So in that sense, the algorithm can teach us things. And we already talked about the example of algorithm playing games like AlphaGo, where it also showed us a big new feature of reality. And in previous lectures, we talked about other examples, for example, how AlphaGo, this game playing artificial intelligence, Google's DeepMind, has shown us something about a game that we've played for thousands of years, and it showed us a completely different dimension of how to look at this game. So the artificial intelligence allowed us to discover things that we ourselves, even after a thousand years of playing, haven't discovered. And that is a benefit of artificial intelligence that we can look into it and that will become a very, or is becoming a very important task to reverse engineer, look into white box machine learning. I was, first of all, convert the black box into a gray box and then white box them and see like, wait, how, how, how does a drone stay still in the air as well com as compared to the hummingbird, for example, and then study that. So that will keep us busy for many, many, many years.